just want to start off by recognizing our traditional territory here and our hosts. Um, I also want to recognize all of the Native youth in the, in the audience as well, um, all the young people here. Um, you're what gives me the hope to be here and the strength to be able to be up on this panel. And I, I wish that all of you were up here with me as well, because um, I think it's really important for us as Native youth to support one another. Um, I also want to recognize, I think there's at least one baby in the room. Um, there's a lot of babies that are in our work at the Native Youth Sexual Health Network. Uh, we don't separate and tell mom, moms or parents to leave their babies outside of the room because uh, we do the work that we do um, for those next generations. So I want to recognize the strength from that young person in, in the room as well. We need to start talking about some of the uncomfortable truths that are happening around resource extraction and development. Um, and so one of the dynamics that often happens in our work is that when we are traveling, uh, since we work across Canada and the US, is that increasingly we are hearing from young people that um, there are increases in sexual violence, in the disappearances and murder of indigenous women, um, and of young people, it's not just women, it's also young men um, and children as well, that are experiencing high rates of sexual violence when industry comes into their territories. And I think areas like Alberta, Montana, uh, North and South Dakota are places where we're seeing huge increases of domestic and sexual violence and increasing numbers of missing and murdered Indigenous women. Um, and I think that we need to start naming that pipeline of violence. That, that, and we need to start, um, in, instead of just saying that Indigenous youth or Indigenous women are at risk all by themselves, we need to start saying that um, pipelines, industry, fracking, they're the industries that are co committing sexual assault um, committing sexual violence um, and, and increasing that violence in our life. While we're fighting pipelines um, or fracking or development, you know, we're also losing women in our communities every single day. Um, and so there's a real, there's a real urgency to, to these issues as well. In order to create sustainable change for our communities, like not only do we have to do our community work and you know um, build upon our, our indigenous knowledge, but we also have to hold political systems accountable um, to um, honor our, our ways of knowing, our ways of being, our ways of healing. We talk a lot about um, domestic violence and just violence and how that's inflicted upon American Indian women, and. Uh, yeah, you know, we recognize that some changes have been made recently, Tribal Law and Order Act and the Violence Against Women Act. And those things are great. They're really fantastic. Um, but we support and um, promote policy change for urban Indian communities. And so 70% of all American Indians live in urban environments right now. And if you think about California, that number jumps to 90%. 90% of American Indians in California live in urban environments. And guess what? Tribal Law and Order Act and Violence Against Women Act do not touch those communities. Those resources aren't going into those communities. In fact, when we bring up uh, issues surrounding violence um, with the urban Indians in public health forums, it's like we're talking to deaf ears because they have no idea we exist often, right? So that's the work that we've dedicated ourselves to. So we have a project called Red Women Rising, and it is about um, education and awareness and really calling attention to uh, the impact of domestic violence on urban Indian women. Um, there are a few other components, and that is about holding systems accountable, right? So urban Indian women are often subjected to regular um, public health systems, which aren't really designed for us. So we want to incorporate our traditional ways of healing, right? Our traditional ways of knowing into these systems. And the way we're doing that is building a network of traditional healers. And so we are working uh, with an organization in Sacramento, it's called Weave, and uh, along with uh, our Sacramento Native American Health Center is one of our member clinics. And we're building a model to operationalize this system to incorporate traditional healing into um, systems of care for survivors and families, and even perpetrators, right? Oftentimes, we, our communities talk about how we talk about violence, and we talk about it from a victim's perspective, and we provide all these resources for those victims, and then we forget about the perpetrators, and sometimes they're members of our community as well. And our way of dealing with that is ostracizing them, right? And they said, you know, that's not the way we, we work. 
We all have community roles and community responsibilities, and in order to solve this problem, we have to deal with it as a collective, right? We, have, we really have to address that historical trauma and the reasons that this cycle of violence has inflicted our communities. You know, it's just like a virus, like a disease. And so those are some of the things that we're doing right now. There's another thing that I'm um, particularly passionate about. All of my work has been around um, traditional health. We have a project called Traditions of Health, and it is dedicated to getting our um, traditional and cultural practices to be recognized as standalone, um, community-defined practices to heal our communities. And what I'm particularly interested in is not like recreating those or revitalizing those. Our communities are already doing those things, right? We already have people who are keepers of that knowledge. They're sharing that knowledge and they're exhausting themselves with providing those services without being compensated. And so we're looking at ways to make sure that those systems are sustainable. And right now, um, the Affordable Care Act just came down. And one of the things uh, I see as a huge window of opportunity is the fact that they named complementary and alternative medicine as, um, you know, but they've acknowledged that. So other communities are taking advantage of it. You know, Asian American communities are now billing through the state Medi-Cal system for acupuncture. And I'm like, if we can bill for acupuncture, then why can't we bill for sweat lodge? You know, we can bill for sweat lodge. We can bill for talking circle. And so we have a particularly uh, important position that we come from. So not only are we, you know, this ethnic community, rich, vibrant, passionate cultural communities, but we also are political entities. And one of the things that Gaji, <laughs> I can't believe you're sitting here because I, I keep like rehashing all of these conversations. Uh, Gaji said to me, you know, they have to listen to us. Like we have sovereign rights and we have rights to self-determination, you know? And so we have that within our tribal communities, but we also have that as urban Indian organizations. A lot of people don't know that. Indian Self-Determination and Education Assistance Act, Education Assistance Act said, you know, we as Native communities know what's best to heal our communities. We get to make those decisions around programming. There was a subsequent amendment in 1988 that also extended that very same right to urban Indian organizations. People don't know that, right? And so I want to make sure that people know that. The notion of woman as the first environment isn't just about a, an organ in our body, the uterus, the womb. It's about the totality of the woman's being, not just the individual woman, but again, the transgenerational lineage back to the creator women, the, uh, the mitochondrial DNA, which we heard mentioned the lineal DNA, but it wasn't specific to the mitochondrial DNA which is why our, our indigenous intelligence always went through the line of the mother, uh, because that's how the genomes are inspected from a scientific standpoint. It's not what the Jesuit uh, missionaries who came up the St. Lawrence River back in the early 1600s who wrote in their journals, the Mohawk women don't know who the fathers are and that's why their clans go through the women, go through the mothers. That really says a lot about where their minds were at and nothing about the reality of indigenous women whose voices through uh, the ac academy and, and the scholarship over the last 500 years were not represented and so it's exciting to see a whole new generation that's emerged that is using their voice quite well. Uh, the word in Mohawk language for midwife is yewilogwas. And it means, when you think about it in the metaphors of the language, she's pulling the baby out of the water, out of the earth, or a dark, wet place. And this particular key into what birth is as a reality uh, brings together this, the nuances of these intersections that we talk about between health and environment. And in fact, the Institute of Medicine, who are these practitioners and scholars who inform the Congress of the United States who control the purse of all of our taxes, um, have described the environment as our bodies. 
uh, that even the fat that we carry on our midsections are considered part of the environment. And so when we talk about environmental health, we have to realize that we're talking about everything. And that realization has started to emerge through increasing scholarship. In my community, as a practicing midwife, I began to be questioned by mothers I was delivering at home. Is it safe to breastfeed, given that this we live within a mile of, at that time, the largest Superfund site for PCB contaminants in the country? And today, after 30 years of research, we know that these PCBs, which are persistent organochlorines, our adolescents carry in their fat tissues, in their bloods. Uh, in, they're in the 95th percentile in the country for PCB uh, contamination. And so we have published papers in the Journal of Pediatrics and other um, uh, scholarly journals, um, results from 30 years of looking at the generational impacts, which are pretty much the data you would see generally in, in the population of North America. And so uh, the reality is true that breast cancer and other reproductive cancers are environmental uh, etiologies. They're caused by the environment. And so when we get back to that fat on the abdomen, the latest scholarship is showing, the studies are showing that uh, mercury in your blood is directly connected to is insulin resistance. And again, because pregnancy is a transgenerational event, those exposures are carried from the grandmother into the subsequent generations up till about the third generation. So that even when you talk about food sovereignty, if a grandmother was deprived um, of nutrients, say in a famine, then her granddaughters, her offspring, will develop metabolic diseases that, use, that include diabetes type 2. And so this is an example of a transgenerational across the generations. So when you go for your prenatal visit, it's really limiting for the clinician to study you as an individual when in fact you're looking at multiple generations of impact. And that is the environment. I feel that I've been standing um, in a door to open to this next generation that I'm so happy to and privileged to sit with. Um, from my grandmother who delivered me at home and her mother who delivered all of her children at home um, to this coming generation. Uh, over 30 years ago, I was the only Aboriginal midwife um, accepted into a program in Ontario under which there's a uh, legislation in the province of Ontario that Aboriginal healers and Aboriginal midwives can practice by no regulation from the government. So that means we have to self-regulate. In order to uh, not lose our rights, we have to use our rights. Mm -hmm.